The problem of the Zeta has finally been solved, right? That's the big takeaway. Sure, we could definitely say that it's kind of solved. Now, I guess I'm kind of talking about how I feel about it. I've been fascinated by and constantly studying for my own you know, curiosity the pronunciation of Latin and ancient Greek. They interact a lot, so that's very helpful. Does this recent video about the pronunciation of Zeta really solve or clarify the problem? And the Epsilon Iota one, which was the first one I even attempted to do in the series, I already had a pretty clear idea and I still stick with everything I, I said in there. It's very clearly Epsilon Iota changes to, you know, E, except in front of vowels, right to the, the first century BC. So does Zeta actually have those pronunciations? And in the second century AD, can we imagine that there are people who are saying Z? Could be. Just learned from a commenter, by the way, this is partially a response to the uh, great people who responded already in the comments to the video, that in the, um, what's it called, the uh, Dodecanese, that is uh, dialects of modern Greek on these uh, 12 islands, hence Dodeca, Dodeca, um, for 12 in, uh, in Greek, and on uh, Simi, specifically spelled Shumi, Simi, actually pronounce Z, so like, I think it's Zoe for life, instead of Zoe, so like Zoe. And I'd also want to know if it's Z or Z. I think it's going to be Z, which is also interesting. Um, in modern Greek, modern standard Greek, as far as I can hear, as far as I can tell with my ear, the occasions that there's Z and Z, it's not retracted, even though there's the sibilant, the sh, you expect it to be retracted all the time. But it should be like sh, so it should be. Zh. You, I would expect z and sa, but every time I've heard Greeks say sa and za, it's like I would do it. It's like an Italian would do it. So that part doesn't seem to get retracted, which is consistent with other things. For example, in antiquity, where it is, this, okay. Um, in late antiquity, let's see. There's the um, Papirianus, Roman grammarian, Latin language grammarian. He talks about the pronunciation of justitia. With, you know, and he describes it that it's T Z I, justi now clearly that's justitia, which is how we uh, pronounce it in ecclesiastical pronunciation. Now, obviously, that's that makes ecclesiastical pronunciation sound like it's, you know, a legitimate uh, version of the ancient Latin pronunciation. It's not, though, because you'd often have to say meridies, meridies, or something, meridies. In any case, why is this person using T-Z-I instead of T-S-I, like other Roman grammarians have done? And it could be because of the retracted S. The S should be retracted regularly in both Latin and Greek, just because there's no distinct sh and j phoneme. So you would expect um, the S to be just to fill that space. It's very regular for languages that don't have a sh and j. Now, that would kind of make sense if the common Greek uh, z, that z, as I'm pronouncing it, like modern Greek, z, z, uh, like joi, joi, we would expect it, if it comes from z, to start up more, more dental, not very retracted, z, and then to become more z retracted, to become the just voice counterpart of the sigma, more and more over time. So it's very interesting if, you know, we, we would expect the first stage, if it goes from z to be z, and then to retract a z. How quickly would that happen? A generation? Twelve generations? I don't know. But it's a very interesting thought. Uh, so that's, uh, that's an interesting... It's interesting how that compares, too, because I want to... With these um, dodecanese ones. Now, uh, Raf... Uh, Rafael Torrigiano, uh, he went and posted a, a great comment uh, about this because he actually got me thinking about this for a long time. And this was um, his conversations that uh, that he's had with me have been so influential on my thinking. He's such a great linguist. And 
I just got the idea that maybe the zda, the zda pronunciation, like a like atenas de or like pezdos, pezdos. That's like less believable to me. That pezdos, the pezdos, and that kind of thing would be impossible. A metathesis, because if it were an affricate, pezdos, that's what it had to have been. If it's going from pedios, it would be pezdos. That that, that makes sense, but pejdos, so it would be the metathesis of an affricate. And while attestations of such a thing apparently exist, there's the, um, the me, what is it, media, becoming um, um, like miezhta and so forth in, in Slavic. There, that does apparently happen, but rarely enough for, for both of us to feel like, well, that's, that seems pretty sketch, especially because the there most of the examples of zeta are etymologically they would have to have been z before they became uh this metathesized z. What really convinced me that it would well, what would what would the alternative be for classical attic? The alternative for classical attic would therefore have to be uh z. Like it was Z and then it became Z and the Zda thing, probably not pronounced. So that would assume that it's not ever Atenas de, but you add the letter D to it, the delta, and they would just immediately, at least in the classical period, have made it Atenas de. And there could have been speakers doing that. Uh, that's possible. It's just, it all seemed like equally possible and weird, but what really put me over the, uh, the edge of believing that there was uh, legitimacy, legitimacy in this was partially reading Sturdivant. With, you know, <laughs> yeah, I have, here's uh, Wax uh, Latina, Wax Caraica, treasured books of mine for, you know, a uh, decade and a half. But he so frequently referenced Sturdivant, and I couldn't find a copy. I finally found one. And it is so much better <laughs> than Alan. You know, I, Alan's, Alan's great, but he has so many more examples. And there's still some things that I might disagree with, but he um, has better quotations. You can see a little bit more, uh, more examples, more thought process. And then way he really said that maybe all three are going on at the same time is interesting because Alan's, you know, about recommending one to the other, you know, one, one thing. And that's, that's a mentality we all have. I, with great difficulty, weeks, um, been able to actually pull away from the idea of this was the pronunciation, maybe accepted it. Yeah, variance. But that's the pronunciation you, know, you should use. Somewhat, you know, a prescriptive based on an attempt to find a descriptive model that explains everything. Um, and the more that I read with all these things, the more it seems like the evidence just points to multiple things going on at the same time that are Attested, maybe not attested very well, but attested partially, especially with all the stuff that, that's in Egypt. Like you have stuff in Egypt attesting um, the fricativization of Radava, but not of Katapa, which remain aspirates. The very fact that Coptic spelling is the way it is speaks to this fact. You know, sine du wheel, <laughs> without any, without much doubt. While you don't see the fricativization of the voiced gadaba or gadaba over in Italy, certainly not right away, but there is some evidence, not nearly as strong, but evidence that it's the voiceless ones that are aspirating first. And eventually all gets aspirated. And it's not all at once. You know, they start with maybe, uh, maybe it's the, the, the gamma was first and then it was the beta. Depends where it was. And the, the desire to find like the one model that explains everything is tantalizing. And boy, that would be great. <laughs> but um, the uh, the Greek language stubbornly refuses to do that. It's so much easier with Latin because they're just not only is there there's a lack of attestation of variety. And um, Jan Adams' book, uh, the regional variation um, in Latin of the Latin language, can't remember, regional regional diversification of the Latin language, demonstrates that you know the little bit that there was is scant compared to how much there already was in Greek by the time anybody was writing anything um, very interesting in it with, you know, in the different places. So and you would have colonization of Italy and other places in the Aegean, bef like hundreds of years before classical Greece. So it's 
it's not like that with Latin. You know, you have, yeah, there's some conquest, but it's just Rome doing it. <laughs> so it's just, it's essentially the uh, spreading of one dialect with some variations, like the um, voisin, which is from a uh, rustic wekinus instead of wekinus. So there are a few scant examples of rustic Latin that made its way to be the primary you know, word or two in other places in Romance, but it's not that common. Anyway, uh, Raph mentioned in uh, the comment directly to the video, thanks to this buddy, this is very helpful to think about, that if those compounds like the um, like shundesmos and also the shustema, or uh, in the case of the zeta or zeta or, z- or zeta, um, if it the um, what's the name? Oh yeah, shujux um, instead of shunjux, so shujux. If those compounds predate the shift that merged etymological zda and z, then they wouldn't really point to one or the other being the merged value. And so I think it's not unlikely that the merged value was z rather than z, And that's, uh, of course, an excellent way to think about it. Now, I <laughs> haven't uh, looked that, that much specifically for that in the Attic Inscriptions. I do have the book on it. Uh, the last time I read it, I didn't notice anything that would suggest that. Just searching um, the uh, TLG, uh, I found that there are six attestations of sigma, upsilon, uh, nu, and then sigma. So there's shuns f- five times. Or the six times? Five times. Five times. And uh, what about sigma, upsilon, nu, zeta? Two times. Now, the sigma is more common, so we'd expect it to be higher. But essentially, in all of this, that, so the TLG, this is the version I have, is just um, the free one. So you know, Homer, um, all the way to, you know, Hellenistic, uh, early mid-Hellenistic uh, time, pre-Roman. That's pretty, I mean, assuming that's representative of anything, uh, it seems like the um, compounds, because it seems like it's a functional thing, that, or it's, it's a productive thing, the dropping of the nu in front of it, because you see it also in, um, in spellings between words. The nu is normally dropped in front of the sibilants, or the, the only fricative is that sibilant, the sh, or the zd, zd. and uh, between words, uh, uh, the form of sandi, other forms of sandi are seen as well, but not the, um, but, uh, and, and also in front of the, the zeta. So it, it doesn't seem to demonstrate any kind of preference for that. Now, the dialects represented, Attic and Koine, that's atticized, or reasonably atticized, so... It uh, it makes it pretty. I don't think so. I'd have to. I don't have enough evidence. You know, I haven't seen enough, and I should probably reread it anyway, to really make a call on that. But my gut tells me that, given. Well, here's the other thing, that Rap pointed out to me. There's a problem <laughs> with the writing systems. <laughs> you know, it's so interesting. These the Greeks didn't invent their letters. They borrowed them, and so they used what made sense. Oh, that reminds me. Roman, Latin, transcriptions of the Zain in Punic, so the Carthaginian Phoenician, apparently have sigma, <laughs> S-D, like uh, there's an Esde. I saw that under the uh, Zion article on Wikipedia. Uh, and they would also explain names like uh, Hasdrubal, I believe that's another one of them, but I'd have to have to look up how that ought to be spelled in Punic to be sure that's actually Zion. So there might have been the same kind of metathesis thing, but I would assume completely independently over in the Carthaginian world. So the problem is that sigma being phonemically voiceless, it'll only be voiced in front of voiced consonants. And that's be- that makes sense why sigma plus delta would be zda. Because delta plus sigma, if you had that, well, it couldn't be z because you expect the sigma, being phonemically voiceless, to devoice the delta. Any word that ends in a d, uh, gosh, nothing in Greek I can think of, but in Latin, um, quad, 
quad sum. It would make a T sound, quad sum. And probably, because the tsa isn't, you know, a really significant phoneme, most Latin speakers would probably end up saying something like um, quas sum. You know, maybe just geminate the S, like the mesentius example. Probably that was tsa, actually, uh, for the um, uh, Tresca name. It was tsa, probably voiceless, I would guess, even in the time of um, Velius Longus. Although he said that, it's, well, yeah, we went with a Z, but we rendered it as two S's because it already went through the assimilation of Ts into S. So the problem is that if it's following the rules, the sigma should devoice the delta. Even though Wellius Longus uses that example of the, uh, we say it in ads instead of asd, you know, and so forth, putting the, the zeta in there, it should make it ts, and ts is an inadequate way to describe z. Thus, Raff uh, came with this great idea that maybe when they're talking about sigma plus delta, they are describing z every time. But the reason that they put sigma first is because of this, this uh, uh, regressive voicing or devoicing. Because if it's actually delta plus sigma, and they're being honest about the sigma's voicelessness, it would have to be ts and not z. But they put the sigma first to make it sure it's it's this uh, th that's all voiced, and that would then explain the affricate z that sigma delta. It would be just a digraph way to explain that that would make more sense than delta sigma because of the devoicing nature of the sigma regressively. And I found that argument very persuasive. And it made me really doubt for a long time that the whole um, Atenas de thing was the right way to go with, with that. However, seeing the description so often and having these various grammarians specifically say it starts with, you know, the one and ends with the other. Some will say it starts with the plosive. Well, it starts with the d, and then ends with s, z. Or saying it, if that's the one that they're talking about. Uh, like we saw, there's different grammarians say different things. And others saying, no, it starts with a s, and then it ends with the st, so z. And they say it with their terminology, but it starts with the semivocalis, which is their word for sibilant, and it ends with the muta. Uh, which is the stop, or plosive, or occlusive. They, so it's the, and that's what that actually means. So because they said it's so m the same language, not the same language, the same kind of uh, linguaggio, the same terminology, so clearly that opening my mind to the possibility there could be more than one at the same time, yeah, it kind of makes sense, of course. There's different accents, and things all around the world at the same time. For example, there are, uh, there's the cot, cot merger. RAF has that. Lots of people, millions of native English speakers have the cot, cot merger. I do not. And, I, and that and the pin pen merger, for example, there all these, these interesting mergers that are uh, happening now in English and that not everybody has, but are some maybe becoming more common depending where they're coming from, if it's a demographic uh, area that's uh, increasing or others that are decreasing. It's going to change things presently and in the future. That's how languages work. But, you know, if we talk about, it, you know, like, oh, well, you just have the old pronunciation. Or something um, progressive that I might have that other people would, might have as uh, regressive, you know. It, so it really changes your mind about things because when when you see that there's this variety going on now, that's not really obvious. You know, where you long? Like, if you ask me about um, a, you know, this a couple of years ago, do cod and cot have different vowels? I'd say, of course. <laughs> like log and lot have different, <laughs> different vowels. Um, completely ignorant of something I've probably heard lots of times, uh, whether on TV or, you know, the internet or wherever, or just people I know, with that merger, I'd just be completely ignorant of it because it was go off what what I think of, and surely, with much less data 
probably, much less, and also much less linguistic thinking, these grammarians have the same thing. They might know about some variety here or there. Like I could, you know, back then have said, well, yeah, it's, it's the same, yeah, caught, caught. We have make that distinction in English. But the Brits, because they have more, you know, rounded or back, back sounding vowels, they're different, but they would be with uh, caught and uh, caught or something, right? I'm not very good at that, but like, I would still think they're different. Also unaware that many Brits also have the merger, but they merge to a different way. And now I know the Canadians merge it also more towards the uh, more rounded kind of uh, vowel. And a lot of Americans do it more in the uh, the unrounded version. Anyway, so there's all these things going on. So with the unfortunately poor evidence that we have for the, these kinds of things, you know, we have a few grammatical grammarian attestations, inscriptions, we have enough to go on, enough to say that something exists. Like saying that the koine, com the common pronunciation in, you know, centuries of time, starting with the fourth century and just getting more, you know, it, you know, you could just, you could also say fourth century, it's z and that's it. But that doesn't explain Sappho, which, by the way, is something I, d I put in a pinned comment, but I didn't actually adequately um, explain that, I don't think, in the video. Because I was trying to, like, tease it, and then I was going to come back to the Sappho thing, and then I didn't actually explain it. Um, I don't know, maybe that's interesting, or maybe you were able to piece together. But what I wanted to get to there was the only clear explanation I have for Hellenistic era Koine scribes spelling, like Bejdon and so forth, instead of just using the, the, the zeta that they had, is that they knew the correct pronunciation in lesbian aeolic. And if that's the case, it's very interesting. It's interesting on so many levels. And it's the best explanation I have. Now, what it does is it makes it totally clear that some common, like certainly for the, the way those scribes and lots and lots of scribes are rewriting it and spreading it around uh, the Hellenistic Empire and then later to uh, the Roman Empire and so forth. They're writing it that way, and that's how it gets passed down to us. Also, interestingly, uh, Aeolic is uh, psilotikos or psilotike. It's um, uh, psil psilotic. It uh, doesn't have the huh. <laughs> so it shouldn't have huh. It's also an interesting question if Aeolic is missing the aspiration, can it in fact maintain aspirates? I don't know. Any language, though, you know, <laughs> our knowledge can be pretty limited. I know any language that has aspirate ta ka pa, but doesn't also have a ha huh of some kind. So I, but th and maybe there is one, and, I, and please let me know if, if you do, but it makes me think that did all of those go to fricatives? <laughs> you know, that those kinds of things really um, baffle me. But there are so many things that are, uh, that, that are irritating about the whole thing. Oh, which I want to get to, but the, the final thing on, on uh, the uh, lesbian aeolic of Sappho is that it suggests that the conservative pronunciation was still, or the older pronunciation that Attic used to have, is still the pronunciation on Lesbos in the, I don't know, 4th century BC, 3rd century BC, maybe later, but then maybe later it changed. The fact that the Dodecanese has Z still, that's over in the islands towards Turkey. That suggests that it's something they're holding on to. It could be innovative, but man, that and also the fact that um, certain dialects of Greco. I don't know if it's all of it or just just some of it because I barely know anything about Greco, uh, which is the dialect of modern Greek, if you will. That's in Italy, and it's mostly a descendant from Byzantine Greek. It's like modern standard Greek, but it has z. It might also have z, but it definitely has z in certain places. But that could be explained by influence from Italian. And there's a huge amount of mixing going on there. But the fact that it's there and way over on the other side of the old, you know, uh, Athenian Empire <laughs> is very interesting. Very interesting. Well, I guess it wasn't. It's beyond the Athenian Empire there, but the thing I thought, which was the thing I thought, yes, 
great way to. <laughs> uh, the thing I thought that it, uh, is, I wrote this into a comment somewhere. Uh, wrote, Greek phonology times spelling equals unsatisfying in some way in pretty much every century. <laughs> so, there's something just I just I don't find that with Latin. Like Latin, there's something satisfying on, you know, just classical pronunciation. Like, oh, okay, it's simple, it makes sense. Might not be what you know I'm used to or he, whoever's used to if they like ecclesiastical pronunciation. But you know, you can get over it. It's not there's almost nothing alien about it except you have to learn to do phonemic vowel length. But when it comes to the pure qualities, with Greek, though, especially the spelling. Yeah, Latin has a few things. You have the GN, which is spelling uh, you know, magnus instead of magnus. That's such a small difference that it's not that big of a deal. But every, like, there's nothing. It's always, I mean, it's fascinating, but it's so unsatisfying. It's frustrating. That's what it is. Because you have Homeric Greek, right? You know, they talk, well, this is the Homeric pronunciation. No, it's not. You have to rewrite it. Homer didn't have the Homeric pronunciation. You know what? By almost by definition, because his you know, the way you'd ha he'd recite it, which was you know from oral tradition, it was influenced by the various dialects that the the oral tradition was passed down on. There's evidence of at least Aeolic and Ionic in it, and also from different you know centuries. There's like a 400 year peri period there at least, right? For it to, you know, the changes and developments and different things going on. So, it ha you know, the, the Greek, it's the literature itself has all these weird things. What we actually have in most texts is the atticized version of it. So, you know, it doesn't have the wa, it doesn't have the digamma. Digamma is a pretty important letter. <laughs> Without it, the meter doesn't make sense. So you would just have, like, you would either recite in Athens, I guess, you would recite it without it. Or you would put it in. You know, there's all sorts of weird things you have to do. Now, that's okay. I mean, if you want to make some weird compensations to do the Homeric meter in a way that's that's satisfying. But it's so much more, especially something like that, has been so influenced by the very art form of passing it on. Oh, it's really not. So you got that. So already completely unsatisfying. And then you have um, the, you know, Erasmian pronunciation... You can find pretty much everything in antiquity in it. It's hard to find contemporaneously, but maybe. Um, I'm all about phonemic vowel length. It's got that. That's the most important thing. But the epsilon iota is the one thing that I... Pronouncing this A. Gosh, that is such a shame. Darn Erasmus. Um, it doesn't have to be E, but it would have to be A otherwise, as it certainly was in classical Attic. It's uh, it, it's not a diphthong, but it's like, oh, well, it was a diphthong. No, 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 only half of them were. The same with the, I mean, you don't pronounce Omicron Upsilon as O. It was for like half of the O, the O, U, was O, but the other half was always just a long O. Like say the the second person um, accusative plurals of Logos or something. It was, you know, Logos. Um, it would have been an N, would have been an N S, then the N fell off in front of the sigma, I think, something like that. Um, so it's always like phonemically long. It would never have been an O, right? But they merged into the long vowel. Like you'd have to merge both into diphthongs to be, you know, linguistically consistent, or both into monophthongs, and the monophthongs just make way more sense. Um, a E is not a supported sound for you know, 6th century, yeah, even 7th after, I think it's from the 7th century BC to the present. You know, those are digraphs. Um, because the spelling, uh, like I mentioned in the old uh, Epsilon Iota video, was stabilized in 403 BC. So it's, you know, so that's unsatisfying. And then there's the unsatisfyingness itself of the fact that those digraphs are there, and you either pronounce them, you can pronounce them like mount of thongs, but then you have to get the difference between E and E. I don't mind that, but then what should the epsilon be? Is it a closed E, or is it a mid, mid E, or is it an open E? You know, um, and that's not clear. By the way, just in case you think, oh, well, it's definitely closed. No. I mean, Alan mentions that. True mid is probably better. Um, as a model. Now, 
going forward, shortly thereafter, the whole Zeta thing that, you know, I spent so much time on by Aristotle's time, he's like, well, it's becoming Z, essentially, is what I think he's saying. And the uh, inscriptional evidence supports that conclusion. Okay, great. So it should be Z. Was it Z in classical Attic? Because the Z, I used to think it was hard to support, but now I think it's fine. Definitely not for pronunciation that would call itself koine. Um, but that's just how I see it. I see the utility of doing it, because if you have a native accent where your S, thus your sigma between vowels, you would voice naturally, like, I don't know, uh, if you were inclined to pronounce that Ryuzo, because your sigma does that, does that in French, does that in German, some accents of Italian then I can see why you would want to make that zeta really clear uh, into something else. And the zda, apparently it existed. In the 2nd century AD, it existed somewhere in the Doric accent or dialect. Apparently it existed in Hellenistic times, if not later, in um, the Lesbian Aeolic. So it's hard to, to deal with all of that. And then, of course, you have the long diphthongs, you have the I and the A and the OI. Those are just not comfortable to pronounce. I don't know why, because we have them in southern U.S. English. Like, uh, like boy. Uh, I've heard that before when I lived in Alabama. Boy. And, you know, A. You know, and I. Like, I and OI. Yeah, I can imagine. Those can exist. But those have to exist alongside I and OI. Sure, it's possible, and a, and uh, and then just one a, not e. It's unsatisfying because it doesn't feel symmetrical. But anyway, they go away. I think it's interesting too that Alan and Volksgreika mentions that well, since those are hard to pronounce anyway, we can just anticipate the pronunciation by a few centuries. Really? Because his whole thing before is like, well, it's just duh. That's the, it. Wait, I, no, I wanna. I wanna get this out. Okay. So, Zda's on page 56. He says, on page 56, he underlines his recommendations here. There is fairly clear evidence that at, a qui at quite an early period, the symbol of Zayin, later you know, written like a normal Zeta, had come to represent the sequence Zda. You know, that's what he says. That's what he, that's his recommendation. Okay. Oh, what about the long diphthongs on page 84? Well, he says of them, it's a discussion, the simplest solution seems to be one which is in fact quite widely adopted, namely to anticipate developments by two or three centuries and to pronounce I, A, OI as A, E, O, i.e. without their diphthongal element. Really? It's so interesting. This is why um, stuff stuff is great. It's super useful. But it's like, really? I, you, you're, you really, you say, now it does make sense though, because those are just really hard to do. It's not, you have a, you can deal with the phonology, but then the spelling itself is awkward, especially since it is traditional to ignore them. So you have to teach that. And then, Fricatives. I mean, you've seen the Lucian pronunciation video. They're so frustrating. You either don't make any of the six fricatives, or you make them all fricatives. You could have the um, affricate in between, like instead of k or ch, you say k, and so forth. Um, that's really cool. But that's so hard to teach. It is intermediate. You know, I would like to do it, but I also don't want to. And then you get to modern Greek. The further you get to modern Greek, the more the orthography is archaic, uh, obviously. It preserves all these things. All the sound changes have occurred, but the spelling is reasonably close to Koine Attic, depending on, on the word. So that's incredibly unsatisfying. Yeah, you can get used to it, like weird spellings in any language. It's not as bad as, you know, who, you name your language. Um, 
But gosh, it makes me feel like what it must be to be uh, a person learning the spelling of English as an adult. So Greek phonology times spelling is unsatisfying in some way in pretty much every century. <laughs> and I guess I'll close that here. I just wanted to uh, go over a couple comments I had based on the uh, recent video about Zeta. What do you think? What pronunciation would you use? I don't care at all if you use the Lucian uh, pronunciation, as Raph and I call it, Samosatine variant or one of the others. Uh, all that's it's great if you do or not, or, you know, what are your preferences? What are you, what are you trying to do? You know, I think about it so much because the communication problem, actually hearing something recited, makes it difficult. You know, phonemic vowel length not being acknowledged in Latin by a number of speakers, for whatever reason, I don't have as hard a time. I do have a, sometimes, you know, as much as I, you know, I'm comfortable with Latin, if someone says something that, you know, if they say, just saying statim, throws me way off. Uh, it's a statim, you know, or if they say, uh, you know, datus, it's a datus. I don't know why, but <laughs> it just sounds so. Uh, it just uh, it's just like I, I think about it so much that it throws me off. But I can get over that. And I usually don't have that many comprehension problems. The other problem in Greek is because accent it becomes associated with length. You know, I might say like if, like I say talata, and because the second one is long and I pronounce it long, even though I have the pitch accent on the first. Actually, there's stress accent there, too. They still have trouble hearing it, and they'll say, Talata, or something. That, that's just one, that's not that hard of a word to understand, but all of the varieties of them, and saying A, and so you just, it's crazy how much that can, that can throw you off. So I don't think there's any easy solution, because even Lucian pronunciation itself is designed to, perhaps stubbornly, not be the only like only one way. It's an attempt at unity, unifying pronunciations, but it's not easy. What are your thoughts? What are your feelings? Thanks so much for watching and uh, thinking about this, this stuff with me, and enjoy Greek. <laughs>